side of red or switch they die. Rob of the dog who loud his motorbike. Looking for legends on the sunset strip. With a stone cold paranormal partnership. That's what time Rick tried to sell me some crack. Listen to the podcast, man, and take that shit back. It's a legends. The podcast of urban legends. And here your host, Neil and Chris. You'll receive our pod in your ears tonight. Hello and welcome to this week's Urbane Legends, the podcast about urban legends, which is the largest on the internet by volume. Hmm, that's a useful metric. Uh, I am one of your hosts, the main host, top host, Chris oh, Flynn, okay. and uh, with me is uh, some other guy called... Uh, I don't know, I can't remember his name. Is it Neil Herbert? Something like that. It's it's like that, does it? Doesn't matter, no. Uh, no as long as you've got your top host, your number one, top of the tree, your triple A host, Chris Flynn. Just let you uh, do the talk on this one, Chris. Oh, <laughs> wouldn't be much different to normal. How are you true. doing? How are you doing, Neil? Have you been enjoying our thunderstorms? We've been having a few thunderstorms, haven't We've we? Been I some like thunderstorms. It. Actually, I was in the uh, I was in the office the other day. There was some. Oh, that was when it was really probably going off on one. Really? Did you? Um, as soon as the lightning started, did you quickly strip off your top, grab your guitar, and rock out on the roof of your oh, office no. building? If only. You no, sat and discussed target operating models. Oh, right. <laughs> it's epic thunderstorms happening. No, it's just it's not very rock and roll, is it? Target no, got, operating models. I've gone middle aged. Um, yeah, back in my twenties, though. Would you have done it in your twenties? No, no, absolutely not. I've never rocked out in a thunderstorm. Dangerous, Chris. Electrical what? equipment and thunderstorms. Yeah, I mean, you're a, you're like a fucking little Lord Byron. You'd be straight out there. Of course, I would. Yeah, 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 it. yeah jaggering it up at the front. Yeah, peak peacocking. Come and uh, get me like clapping my clapping my hands. Chance would be a fine thing, you'd say. God, I remember um <laughs> one of the most insulting things that Graham's ever said to me. Graham is a friend of ours who we've yeah, yeah. been in bands with, yeah. with and worked with and stuff. Yeah. Um, was he said that as a front man I reminded him of Fred Durst and then I punched him. Punched his head clean off. <laughs> I thought you were going to say like Mick Jagger and you're pissed off. No, no. That. there'd be no nothing wrong with that. But um, I think because of my physical, because of my physical size, maybe. But like, I can't really do look like Mick Jagger because I'm not, I'm not waif like. Graham, that was almost certainly intended to be a compliment. Of course it was. One. Still didn't stop me knocking his head off, clean off his shoulders. And, yeah, um, I don't know. He's just kind of like a bit. You know, chunky and shouty, you know, Fred Dest. Well, I think I, I could never stand like I could never stand the amount of limit. I mean, fair enough to you if you like that. That was fine. It's just I, you, you know, when I was a teenager, I was into sort of trash and uh, death metal and things like this. But, you um, um, you saw the band Reef, uh, um, the Pressure Points, didn't you? Which used to be a live music venue in Brighton, which doesn't exist anymore, like all of them. Yeah, I can't um, remember where I saw Rafe. Yeah, they, did, the they did yeah. the song, put your hands up, put your hands up. Yeah. And um, you said that everyone in the crowd, because you're all cool, cool thrash guys, you all sat on the floor. When well, it, it, was was a mixture, it was a mixture of different people. This is when they were very, very early on. I think yeah. they might have done the Sony advert at that point, but they, they weren't. No, they wouldn't have been playing the pressure right. point. You'd be, well, you, I can't remember, mm-hmm. but I think they were with the, the mini discover, but they, because, um, yeah. It was just the tune and stuff, but no, I mean that was a good, good enough tune. But no, it just I don't know the the the, the singer was it just came across as a bit unsuffer on stage, and I think it was that like singers. quite sparsely into yeah, that's true. You, you quite think quite that sparsely of all atten- attended, but no, it's that whole thing. He's you like, think that of a, everyone who isn't a guitarist? Yeah, that's true because um, it's, it's <laughs> accurate. But no, it was um, I can't I can't remember now. Um, I don't want to cast aspersions. Probably we were all snotty teenagers, but I just I vaguely have a recollection that. Um, you know, it's that one of those things where you bring up that many people at your gig. 
they're not getting into it as much as you'd like. And um, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't just, you know, one particular crowd of people down there. It was kind of like, a, 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 you know, a decent selection of people into rock music. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously that's, we didn't, we never heard of them at that point. I just remember them mm. afterwards. And, um, you know, there are other, well, it was just, a, you know, punk rock was quite big at the time. I guess a lot of people were probably aping the Red Hot Chili Peppers or something. I yeah. don't know, but it was, you know, all punk rock and funk metal were quite big at the time. Um, so you'd heard, you know, it wasn't something that was that that fresh, I guess. But I mean, that's like, to be fair, put your hands up, or whatever it's called, it's a decent enough tune. Um, yeah, but anyway, so he was, it was that whole kind of thing where he starts having a go at the audience, like, oh, get up, and some new, blah, blah, blah. Um, but, you know, with a bit of a annoyance and stuff. So yeah, yeah. everyone just sat down on the floor to be obnoxious. Yeah. And um, another tale from... Was kind of amusing. <laughs> another tale from the pressure point is, didn't you used to... Because this was before I started going there. I don't think um, it was the pressure point, because that was the Richmond, isn't it? Yeah. Or was same, the Richmond? Same thing. I, I played them, yeah, quite a bit when it was the Richmond, but... Um, it became no, I don't, pressure I don't point. think that was where I saw Reef. I can't remember where I saw them there. I mean, you, that's um, what you told me, but then this story you told me probably 10 years ago. Um, yeah, I can't remember. And you used to uh, all line up by the side of the stage and then go up and take turns stage diving. Is that something yep. that used to happen? <laughs> yeah, this is the thing that <laughs> Like happens. queue up like you're at Alton Towers. <laughs> yeah, well, with stage diving, you've got to be prepared. You've got to have someone to catch you. There is not, it's just not like a completely packed venue. And if it's going to be... So what was it, like six sort of... people and you'd kind of... No, like, carry, like carrying a coffin? No, you see, I did... <laughs> I did, well, I saw two things like that once. I, I don't think I've ever said this in the podcast before. But one was, yeah, literally, it was just like about 10 people who were into this. So it was just like, you know, why are you going to people to sort of catch it? It's not really crowd surfing. Um, it's more like um, it's more like a corporate trust fall at that point, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty much. Because, <laughs> um, if you know, if you're in like a, a big gig or whatever, you just, mm. like people got no choice. They're going to have to catch you whether they like it or not. So you sort of try and give them a bit of fair warning. Um, well, I, I did Telegraph anyway. it. Yeah. Um, Here I come. This is where I'm coming, sort of thing. Yeah, you you I get your hands up so the trousers off, boys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a slippery one coming through. Um, yeah, I'm coming yeah, like a greased pig. But but yeah, the one I remember that was just really funny was a, a, one of these sort of rock places where it was, it was it was a reasonably sized venue and there was only about I mean you still get like thirty or forty people in there, but mm. you know you're looking at needing sort of two hundred for it to be rammed to the point yeah. where people are going to have to catch it. Um, yeah, and they, they kind of tried to do a stage dive and it turned into a jump off the stage at the last minute. But the, the great I thing was... Well, no, I think they just because they realised nobody was going to catch them. So um, they could quickly change position and just sort of jumped off the stage. Yeah, and, and then just kind of like um, tried to walk off looking really cool. Yeah. That's what just you like got strutting their step like, yeah, that was what I intended to do. Yeah, jump off the stage. Yeah. Scare the crowds. I checked that someone was going to catch Boom. them. That's what you got to do. Yeah, I don't... Uh, yeah, I don't think that any gigs we ever did I, I felt like anyone would catch me or that it would be fair to me to impose my monolith of a body onto, <laughs> to, yeah, onto the audience yeah. onto the audience really yeah. um, I never I, no, never, felt, really, I, I never felt like they liked us enough really I thought they'd probably just let me die I don't know there's that um, Irish pub in North London <laughs> that guy looked up from his phone briefly <laughs> That was the best thing ever. He spent his whole time. This is the insulting thing. It's like, so we played, what was it called? Tommy Flynn's or something? Anyway, um, we'll remember there was a guy with two leather jackets on, which I thought was quite good. Yeah. Um, we got chatting Double outside. Up. Yeah. You might, you know, you want to be warm. Um, but yeah, just this one guy just, just on his phone the whole time. Camden just style. Enough. Yeah. Um, but like, standing up at the stage and then just staring at your phone. Hmm. Not knowing like he was filming us or anything, just because he just like better things to do, basically. But then I yeah. just remember there was one one bit where he looked up and sort of like nodded and then sort of straight oh, back to his phone again. <laughs> Bored instantly. <laughs> I talk, talk, talk to a man about it. made it worse. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's quite good. Yeah, not not sure about that though. Yeah. Anyway, but I've got I've got I've back to putting some bets on. Um, yeah, no, that was that was our second emptiest gig. That's for sure. Um, but hey, Neil, can't go back. <laughs> no, that's that's probably why we don't do. Yes, yeah, so why don't rock out in thunderstorms anymore? Not that I did. Uh, but hey, so... uh-huh. no, no, go for it. No, as I say, um, yeah, can't go back. Um, so uh, you've got, have you got a story to tell us today, Mister Neil? 
Mr. Neil. Sorry, man. Yeah, I have actually. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about the Beast of Gevaldan. What? Beast of Gevaldan. Gevaldan. I think I'm assuming is how you uh, pronounce that. Um, is that is that foreign? It's a historic region of France. It's foreign. It's from France, isn't it? Oh, okay. That, Lorraine Boisson. The most foreign. Yeah, well, I thought I'd, I did actually have a look for sort of like French urban myths. So I thought, well, let's have a. Oh, here we go. Let's have Frank a look. Francophile Herbert. Yeah, and um, yeah, I like a bit of France. And um, this is what I remember. So those of you who might have, um, oh, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to say something else first, Chris. Sorry, before okay. I, before I dive into this, I'm like a stage diver, ill prepared like, on the stage, <laughs> um, on your face. Yeah. <laughs> uh, did you finish Islander? You mentioned no. maybe a couple of weeks ago. No, I didn't. Oh, no, no, sorry. Okay. So I have been, as you know, Neil, I'm quite a TV aficionado. <laughs> yes. It's uh, going to be about Pele again. It might, might show up, might not. Yeah. I've been watching um, a show called uh, Seal Team. Ooh. Right. And Sounds it's. Butch. Yeah, it's got David Boreanaz, who played the um, paedophile vampire in Buffy. Um, I think the first it. bit being a plot point, but yeah, I think she was quite young. Presumably. Well, she was, well, 16 and he was 500. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. You know, That's breaking maybe, the divide maybe, by two and plus seven. Really, <laughs> at the very least. Maybe, maybe it's fine in some states. I don't know. But um, yeah, I mean, maybe maybe it wasn't technically illegal. Technically, um, so what it is, SEAL team, it's about um, a soccer team made up of seals, Seals. yep. Um, but so, so the so the actors they they are playing it as seals, they're playing it like straight as as sort of anthropomorphic seals, but they just kind of have um, like mascot costumes on, but it. But they're meant to be real seals. Do you see what I mean? So they're not. So yeah. so they're, they're meant to be the creature. They're not meant to be a man in a costume. But yeah. the costumes which they wear, it's quite um, it's quite they're nice. Realistic. No, no, they're like mascot, like mascots, kind of fluffy. Oh, like, oh very stylized. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, so they've got that, and David Boreanaz plays their. Um, it's kind of like he's their coach, and he's. Um, He's is like he a, a seal or is he like no? A he's a misanthropic octopus. Oh, okay, yeah. And I was reading up about it, and the and they based the character on Brian Clough. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's a I, that's that's a deep one pull for the Americans, isn't it? Because Clough's quite. I mean, probably not as well known with a lot of UK football fans of these days. He's sort of fading into memory, but uh, but he was a lot kind of larger in life character, sort of that you know. So they thought, well, we can base it on that, base the character on that. And they play in they play in like a world soccer league. For, Is there an uh, elephant for, that's like a Peter Taylor figure? No, no, there isn't. There, there is. Uh, so you there isn't Cluffy uh, without Taylor, in my opinion. But there you go. Oh no, there is a there is a Taylor character, but oh, he's okay. a, but he's a starfish. Oh right, yeah, fair enough. And he's, he was he's, a goalkeeper, wasn't he? So that's that's good. Yeah, and he scouts scouts new seals for the seal team. So, and and sort of what what it's about is. So all of the different teams, so yeah. like this, they um, they they basically kind of have like one kind of animal playing for them, but then because he's like uh, outside the box thinker, he does like Dave Boreanaz's character, the Clough character, decides that he's going to sign like a different species, going to sign um, a giraffe, right? Yeah, and play for the team because he thinks right that that would do really well, and then it's all about like uh, the the sort of histrionics and all of that kind of stuff, and it's kind of a lot of it's quite like about about racism and that kind of stuff. Um, it's really good. I mean, it, it like it's got a lot to teach. Is this like it, a kids show? Or? No, 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 no. No, there's a lot of there's a lot very of front of new day. There's a lot of need. There's a lot of very visceral kinetic violence. Yeah, is when the seal hunters come in and start culling the pack. No, not yet. But oh, right, okay. nothing like that. No, there are no there are no humans in it. Okay, it's all animal based. Yet. Yeah, it's all animal based. Um, but yeah, just got through the first series. They've um, 
they've signed the giraffe, but the ultras don't like it. Oh, and okay. so, um, yeah, and uh, and there's been a terrorist threat on the stadium. So we'll we'll see where it goes. Um, but you know, for considering it's a, a David Boreanaz sort of vehicle, uh, I've been quite impressed with it so far. Apparently, it's based on a series of um, young adult novels that was written by Pele back in the eighties. So uh, yeah, so that's probably why it's got quite you know quite gritty. Quite yeah. you know it's got well, a, you know he knows from the favelas, doesn't he? So. He does know from the favelas. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff about erectile dysfunction in it as well, which yeah. is good for me because I personally am suffering with that. So yeah. it's nice to be able to read it, <laughs> read it on the page, and um, you know, no, no, I'm not alone. So that's, that's always good, a good place to be. So yeah, um, so no, that that I've been watching that. I got hooked on that, so I didn't get to see Highlander, unfortunately. Uh, okay, well, never mind. It, it's been there since 84 or whatever or 86 so uh, hey it ain't, it ain't going nowhere ain't going nowhere you ain't Lambert ain't going nowhere mind you the way physical media is dying out and uh streaming services seemingly don't want to actually put anything on their streaming services anymore yeah no it might not be don't bother doing that yeah i was reading that one the other day i don't get this too much but um no do <laughs> some, something on disney or whatever and it's just like there's this idea now where they're cancelling stuff before it even comes out. I don't get the business model there. So they, they've done that. It was another young adult thing. I um, can't remember what it's called. I think it was Spiderwick Chronicles or something. Mm. Um, they, they did a movie out of it about 15 years ago. Yeah. It was crap. Um, but anyway, they decided yeah. to do a TV wasn't series. Wasn't Pele, was it? And rather than release... Well, yeah, you should have had Pele involved. But rather than uh, release... Show it, runner. Went, oh, just cancel it before it actually starts. Really? So they didn't even bother showing it? No. Well, they did that with that Batgirl movie, didn't they? Too much controversy. Um, I was axed it because they thought it would be a tax write-off. I don't know, it was a tax write-off or something. Although pretty much everything in the film industry budget yeah. seems to be tax write-offs. Um, I was quite pissed off that they've cancelled American Gods. Oh, have they? So yeah, they're trying to find... Yeah, I kind of got bored of it, I must confess. But, I, yeah, it'd be nice. They're trying to finish. find a way to maybe do, like, a film or something to kind of finish it off like they did with... Um, uh, Deadwood. Deadwood, yeah. Yeah. So they're trying to... Yeah, is there anything, anything Ian McShane's in gets cancelled and they have to do a film to tie it up? Basically, that's how it works. It's what happened with Lovejoy as well. But this thing is, I've read the book years ago, mm. and it's not... I mean, there was a sequel as well, um, but... I do, yeah, they kind of like they spent ages trying to get it. It's not that long a book, to be honest with you. So they could have gotten through it in about two or three series. But it's but a yeah. good, pre- but it's a good premise. Oh, it was a great oh, premise. I thought it was really well done, and I quite like the first because the thing is, I think the first one, I, I can't remember the guy's name, might be Brian Fuller or whatever, but I think he's one of these. He quite often has gets kicked off of TV shows because he was the first showrunner. Yeah, um, and I think that that was a good series. Or that, or that was a good season, or whatever you call it. Um, but yeah, it's the second one. I don't know. It's, it, I don't know, it seems to sort of like be spinning its wheels a little bit. Yeah. I know, I enjoyed it. I like. I really liked yeah, it. It was stylistically, it was great as well, like the direction. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, to be fair, I, don't, I think it might be one of those ones where I just, I think it's because I'd read the book, I was kind of like, oh, when are we going to get to this bit kind of thing was probably where my head was at. But no, but I they kind of like a lot of it, like Mad Sweeney was quite cool. And... But they kind of finished it on like a massive cliffhanger and then they went, nah, cancelling it. It's like, you can't really do that. <laughs> Yeah, you know there was, there was the like guys, it's starting yeah. to fuck me off that they're doing that. Like they'll, they'll like, like if you're going to cancel it, then decide at the start of the series and then they can wrap it up. Do you know what I mean? Don't cancel it on a fucking cliffhanger. Like that's just cunty, frankly. Yeah, oh yeah, I mean this is happening all the time. But again, it's just because it used to be the thing with you know with Netflix, they'd be picking up stuff and renewing it and all the rest of it. But yeah, they did that. There was there was a TV show called Dark which I really liked, and they got three seasons out of it and it wrapped up properly. It was really good. So the new ones came out and it got cancelled off at the end of the first season like about sort of you know two weeks after they'd released it and it's just kind of like yeah they're going apparently the cliffhangers I'm not well I'm not going to bother watching it then because what's the point no. you know I don't and I don't always get around to watching everything on week one so yeah but yeah I think I think they're all struggling for money now so it's kind of like Ow. no they're not struggling for money they're, they're struggling no, no most for... of these are actually losing well they're money. L- losing money yeah they're honestly, I, I do I cannot fathom it mate I don't get how well, I mean, like, considering... It's, it's content you went... Well, I think what it is is because they have to... Well, 
Well, considering like the, the the chief execs at like Netflix pay themselves like thirty million quid a year, do you know what I mean? Like, oh yeah, well that's the, well, this is the thing as well, though, isn't it? Because are um, they shareholders? Presumably, oh, are they shareholders? Yeah, but... yeah. Well, then they're not losing like the they're, they're, they're taking money out of the organisation. Yeah, over the out of the, out of the broader organisation. Yeah, mm. absolutely. But you know the, the thing. Well, supposedly you never know. It's like the famous thing with Hollywood accounting, where they're always saying, you know, you never never ever get anything. Um, that we well, get points on the back end or whatever. Always make sure you get them on the gross and not on the net, because then supposedly, even ridiculously, like you know, the big Star Wars films haven't yeah. officially made a profit. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the way they did accounting. It. Yeah, it's, everything's done. You know, it's very very shady. They kind of like him. Yeah, I don't know. I can't. I don't. If I was like. If I only understood it, I suppose I'd be earning that the big bucks to uh, do the things. Anyway, sorry, we've gone into Hollywood accounting now, so that's we should probably get back to the, uh... so the. If you want to hear more about that, then we'll be starting up a Hollywood accounting podcast very soon. So watch yeah, the space. Actually, remember what the what the uh, the scam is. That, yes, that's how they get away with it. It's quite interesting for me, but uh, anyway, I think a lot of people don't like the glamour, so they don't. You know, they're not going to chase with tax. Anyway, right. So this is from the Smithsonian Magazine. That's and what, nice... Can you remind us again what it's called? <laughs> yeah, well, you're going to find out the title. When okay. the Beast of Givaudan terrorised France. The Beast of Givaudan. The Beast the... of Givaudan. I think that's how you pronounce in the, the name. It's, it's not a... I don't think the village is called that anymore. Well, because of all well, the yeah, stuff that happens. Attempting to pronounce French words here. So, um, But yeah, this is... So this is... Um, Rather you than me. Yeah. So this is, this is kind of like a beast. It's, I mean, there's... There's a lot of genuine attacks and stuff here. So this okay. is a, yeah, a former province that's in the modern day department Dupont of Lozier and part of Haute Loire. Um it's in south central France and this all happened between Oh, that South Central's always where like the the, crime, the gun crime and stuff happens, yeah, isn't it? In go. every yeah. city. Yeah, in, in no matter where. Especially in the eighteenth uh, century. Eighteenth century, South Central. A lot of France. Uh, you know, musketry going off, willy you lily. But gangs. But yeah, so there's, you know, um, it was this kind of like wolf type creature, and I think some people thought it would be a, it was a lion or a striped hyena. Okay. Or a, well, this is looking at um, Wikipedia, and the, the scripture of the period identified the beast as an adolescent male lion, a striped hyena, but possibly, though unlikely, a large wolf dog or wolf dog hybrid. Could it have been a liger if it was striped? Yeah. I was looking up um, hyenas as well because for some reason I, I was thinking of them as like being sort of dog size or yeah, like they're small not very dog big. Size. No, they'd be up to five foot. They're pretty striped hyena. Yeah, but thing. like nose to tip of tail, the five foot. No, no, much. no, not tail. Like um, well, height, like five foot and sort of like uh, no, no, five foot in length without the sort of pretty much without the tail. Um, and they they were sort of going up to about two hundred pounds. So they're pretty. They're chunkier than you think. I'm heavier than that. Yeah, Probably. I'm sure you are, I'm sure, you know, but <laughs> you, know, you thought hyenas are actually quite dangerous, but um, and you think, oh, they're only they're quite small, aren't they? Well, they've got very powerful jaws, I understand, but um, yeah, yeah, anyway, oh, they're so, actually quite they're like a big dog, they're actually quite a lot bigger, yeah. Maybe there are different types of hyena, but I was thought of them, I don't know if I've seen in cartoons or something as being kind of like, like sort of cat or small dog size, <laughs> <That's anyway>. like... <laughs> and you know what I mean? Because you can, you know, you say dog, like a fox or something, Rhodesia Ridgeback is like, you know, yeah. In huge, or that's like I remember there's like a Japanese breed, isn't there? That's like you know, six foot or something ridiculous, but um, you know, they can get on their hind legs and sort of tap on their shoulders, but uh, yeah, 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 and can dance with them, you know, versus the Chihuahua, which is you know, there's dogs a broad spectrum in terms of size, they um, are anyway, right, right, so, beast of Givaudan. The monster's first victim was Jeanne Boulet, a 14 year old girl watching her sheep. Her death was followed by others, almost exclusively women and children. Uh, easy targets. Yeah. Although you think as well how many of them were doing the kind of rural labouring and stuff like that. I, I don't know. Oh, um, unless it, it might have been an incel. That's true as well. Could, be. Could have been, couldn't it? Yeah. Early, early. Uh, early, yeah. Early wolves. Ahead, ahead of their time in the worst possible way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, just maybe don't ever be of any time. That'd be good. Um so throughout nine, um, 1764, excuse me, the brutal attacks, victims with their throats torn out or heads gnawed off. Riveted heads throats. gnawed off. Yeah. So they Riveted. Got... Oh, I'm, have you heard about uh, what is going on in South Central? As there has been uh, 
people with their heads gnarled off. I'm riveted. <laughs> so, yeah. So. There you go. That's, but, um, for anyone who can't understand French, I just um, I just repeat what Neil said, but in yeah, French. Trying to be accurate uh, depiction of uh, 18th hello, century. Hello, hello. Um, <laughs> the character, the yeah. character from Hello, hello. Hello, hello, yeah. <laughs> I just says this, I live on. Um, yeah, so... The violence was so shocking, news of it travelled from the countryside all the way to the royal palace in Versailles. Who oh. is this beast of Givaudan and who could stop it? Who is this beast of Givaudan? said Louis XV. The sick mere, the sick mere. But, in, the, uh, in, the, in the hallway of light. So, yeah, it's, um, you know, this is, this is a bit of a soap pop, the whole of France. There's, you know, it's, it's happening in one specific area, but everyone's kind of like uh, getting into it. Um, getting into it. Yeah, yeah, getting the T-shirts. We didn't have football back in those days or, like, the internet or anything, so... So just get into yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, bit of, bit of I wonder faction. what has happened in Kivudan today. But it's good, because you, 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 as you'll learn, some, some of the victims, like, uh, managed to fight back, so it's it's not it's not a one-way. Oh, have you seen the newspaper? Uh, I hope another small child has had his head <laughs> knocked not. off. Oh, I must, uh, oh, I'm so bored, I must be riveted by something. Written in one of the... So, Gifferdan, a region in southern France, is in modern-day Lozère, apparently, was just as mysterious yeah. as Monster. Oh. Yeah, I don't know where Lozère is, but... Um, the South Central, mate. Yeah, that's true. Um, it had the reputation for being a remote, remote, remote isolated backwater where the forces Uh-oh. of nature had not been fully tamed, where oh. the forests were indeed enchanted. Don't want to be going down there to give us air. Are you going down over there? No. Don't go. You don't want to be going down there. Give all that. For the no. forests are enchanted. Misty we, forests. They we ain't got no time for your Christian nonsense. We still, we still abide by the old gods. You better beware. Don't ain't give it air. Well done. So, so says, so says <laughs> J.M. Smith, a historian and author of Monsters of the Giverdown, The Making of a Beast. It's fascinating, it's powerful, it's scary, it's sublime. It's sassy, it's yeah, current. It's, sense, it? <laughs> it's current, it's I mean, gorgeous, he's, he's trying to sort of and it's here to stay. Bit. So yeah, let's all go. Let's all go it's back a new black. A... I bet the food's good there. Hmm. So it was a perfect place. Oh, it's probably for... all Toulouse sausages and that, isn't it? That's all right. I'd like a bit of Toulouse sausage. Um, it's a bit rough, isn't it? Maybe a bit of cassoulet in southern France. Um, it's a bit organy. We had a we had a nice we had a nice sausage trio the other night, didn't we? Certainly uh, did. Uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, one for no, each a, day. No, that was, we... was a good. Uh, was it at an Argentine Argentinian. Argentinian restaurant? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, Argentinian black pudding, very nice. Mm, you know, I, I would recommend if I could if I could pronounce the name. No, well, they're doing well enough, and they're not going to yeah. give us anything. So that's true. So. Fuck them. But yeah, it's Argentinian restaurant in Brighton, you can probably figure it out. <laughs> um, it was the perfect place for a grim-like fairy tale starring a possibly supernatural creature. With the villagers under attack, reality was more brutal than any book. In three years' time, the beast racked up nearly 300 victims, and its legacy lasted long beyond the 18th century. 300? 300 in three years. It's not too shabby, is it? Fuck me. That's a lot. That's you like one. Now, everyone was kind of like, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, one every three days. Yeah. Or did it do like, did it do multi, multi ones, or was it always individuals? It sounds like it was more kind of like individuals, so I think it was trying to sort of pick off. I don't know that it would have. Um, and they, we'll get to it, but they start sending hunters and stuff after it. Um, well, in fact, one of them reckon, reckons he's caught it, but we'll, we'll come to that. There we go. So France of 1764 was in a miserable condition. Mm-hmm. The Seven Years' War had ended a year earlier, with France suffering numerous defeats at the hands of the British and the Prussians. <laughs> the king, Louis XV... No XVI, surprise there, Neil. <laughs> you think also- they'd learn their lesson? <laughs> They was, Only they, they do a lot of warring with the French, didn't they? Well, and they people. start to be, to be fair, they started it. That's true. Yeah, ten sixty six. Yeah, and also 
You see, there's this whole thing about oh, Britain and France always fighting, but sort of it isn't because the lineage of the British monarchy is they were they were French nobles, so it's yeah. just it's just it's French terrible. nobles versus French nobles, but using British poor people, yeah. essentially. That's what they're doing it. Yeah, go and get killed. Lovely. What else are you going to do? Go and till the fields. Yeah. Fuck that. Rather well, go and get killed. For the royal court, who will speak French. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a... You see, so I've got... So I was thinking about this the other day, and I've not looked into it, but uh, so therefore, pff, normal. Yeah. But, um, so... The Normans, who were the French household, the lineage who invaded... It wasn't truly France at that point, I don't think. No, not not the same way. But they were the descendants of Vikings. Yeah. Because the Vikings had gone and taken a big chunk of France. And then that became... of Normandy or whatever. And it became Normandy. And then... So I'm... So it's all of... So it's basically the problems that Britain and France has, like obviously neighbours, but like all of this fighting and stuff. Really, it's all kind of down to the fucking Vikings again, isn't it? Because they seem yeah. like I'd be interested to know, like across Europe, how many of the really sort of expansionists and aggressive households like trace their lineage back to the fucking Vikings. Oh, yeah, I'd be too. interested to know because they because that just it seems to be it seems to be that's kind of where a lot of the trouble came from. Yeah, could be. Mm. It's interesting, isn't it? I might do that for my thesis. Good. Oh, hmm. Always blame the Vikings. Yep. Your thesis title. Yep. Yep. Thesis title, Why We Should Carpet Bomb Scandinavia. Yeah. <laughs> time time for payback. Finally time for payback. It's your, uh, your thesis at GB News University. Mm-hmm. That's right. I Make the UK them, version of Prague EU. Make them a crown dependency. Nice. Lovely. Get all that lovely saved up oil money that Norway has. Beautiful. Mm. Get that in the pockets of our shareholders. I'm sure that'll be fairly distributed amongst our populace. <laughs> I would have thought so. Straight to them. No, nothing, nothing, there's nothing to suggest that that isn't what would happen constantly in our country. It's like this whole thing and people going on about going back to um, you know, digging out more North Sea um, oil and gas. It's like, but it just goes onto the market and just. Well, know, there's only was... enough. There's, if we took all of the gas out of the North Sea, there's enough for one year's use for like that would keep our country going for one year. So it's like just fucking nonsense anyway. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway. Politics. Talking <laughs> right. of which, politics, 18th century style. So. Louis the Fifteenth. He's lost the bulk of his country's overseas empire, including Canada. Economic situation is dire. Countries in disarray. Do you know what I call Canada? Big friendly Scotland. Yeah, it's kind of kind of true. Yeah, I presume you wouldn't want to tell the old um, Quebecois that, though. Whatever. The Frenchy bit of Canada. So, despite the carnage of the beast draw, it served as a perfect foe for a nation with something to prove. A country needed, of course, to rally around. <laughs> a violent dog. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, that's that's more your measure, Louis. <laughs> Pick a smaller battle. Yeah. Fair enough. The beast and its victims might have gone virtually unnoticed, if not for a burgeoning press. Because political news was mostly censored by the king, that's good, isn't it? Newspapers had to turn to other sources of information. That never happened again. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, it's not being censored by Rupert Murdoch these days. But uh, yeah, newspapers had to turn to other sources of information and entertainment to bolster subscriptions. Francois Morinet, Morinet, I don't know, um, creator Marina. of the uh, Courier d'Avignon, used a new type of reporting called uh, Fates Divers, so everyday stories, um, stories of everyday incidents in small villages similar to today's true crime to tell the tale. True crime. Yeah, so there you go, it was ahead of his time. His reportage in particular transformed the beast from a backwater calamity into a national affair. Mm. So headcount rises in 1764. I mean, that's... The... I mean, the thing is, which I'd say is it's not a small story if it's killing 300, killing 100 people a year. I mean, no, the, no, the, the beast of Bob Moore is quite a national story in this country and all this time is eating yeah. some chickens, probably. Been in a couple of possible photos. <coughs> Yeah, just so yeah. far away, it could be a cat or a leopard. You really got no idea. Whereas this is an actual, like, this is 
I mean, I mean, if it's true, like if he's not just like pumping well, up yeah, the figures. I mean, no, I mean to be fair, we'll go. Mm. We'll, we'll go. We'll go on to some sort of ideas about what it might be at the end. But um, but if it's killed, that'd be up, actually, really nice still. Really. So if it's killing, yeah. if it's killing someone every three days, then I would say that that probably is national news. <laughs> Yeah, but bear in mind, this is the first time that sort of, I mean, this is the very early sort of stage of the press, and it's, you know, they, obviously they're just trying to make some money. So, mm. but it's, to be fair, it's a business like anything else. But, um, yeah, so, and, you know, can't talk about politics because the, uh, you know, it's King, King, no, it's really it. like, yeah, King, King Louis does something awesome again today. Oh, wonderful King. <laughs> That's why we're all starving. <laughs> <laughs> As the cake count rose, local officials and aristocrats took King action. King has hearty breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> King has great idea for distracting populace. Let's start talking about beast of give or down. Um, Etienne Lafont, a, lo- a regional government delegate, and Captain Jean Baptiste Duhamel, a leader of the local infantry, organised the first concerted attack. At one point, the number of volunteers rose to thirty thousand men. Thirty thousand. Yeah, all out hunting for this beast. They could use them in the war, couldn't they? Yeah. Well, maybe they should have sent this, um, yeah, this big exactly. dog off to do some fighting. Yeah. Two were men organised the men along military models, left Poison Bait, and even had some soldiers dress as peasant women in hopes of attracting the beast. Oh, this is a carry-on film, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've got as well, just underneath this, is a sort of a picture of... Oh, um, hello, hello, darling. Um... Don't know, you look lovely today. Would you like to maybe go out later? It's me, you idiot. I'm just dressed up. Oh, see, it's sorry. Didn't mm. realise. You blithering idiot. <laughs> so the reward for killing the beast eventually equaled <laughs> a year's salary for working men, writes historian Jean Marc Morissou in La Bête de Gavignon. Which is uh, French this on France. Of... That's how much. Yeah. Yeah, I do like the idea of just like. <laughs> just get your soldiers dressing up as peasant women. Yeah, Jean Baptiste, you're getting a bit too into this. <laughs> it's not going to be normal soldier service. I, I hope you have shaved your legs because the beast will know otherwise. Uh, yes, yes, I have commander, and I'm wearing a sexy maid outfit too. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like they should have been something that happened in a low, low. Somebody dressed as one of the sexy waitresses. Oh, it almost certainly has. Must have done, must not it? Almost certainly, yeah. Shenanigans in shade. Yeah, like the really camp German commander, commandant, or whatever. Yeah, what was his little tank? Yeah, I bet bet he did. Yeah, almost certainly. So for men like Duhamel, the hunt was a way to redeem his... You must add me, René! (laughs) Oh. The, the commandant is after me. You must hide me. Uh, well, maybe you can just uh, dress up as one of the waitresses. Oh, and hey. What ideas you have? <laughs> I'm into it. Oh, Renee, who is this new waitress you have? She's very beautiful. Hey, come here, sit on my lap, darling. <laughs> Did that kind of thing, wasn't it? Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, that, def- that definitely happens. Definitely. I'll try and track down that episode. Um, I say uh, is, she, is she free for the? Uh, is she free tonight, Renee? <laughs> oh, I, d- I don't know, Colonel. I don't think she's that kind of girl. Oh, I've gotten oh, myself such... into a sticky wicket here. <laughs> <laughs> if I don't let the governor sleep in the waitress, <laughs> I close my curtain down and I go in front of the firing squad. But then if I do, I'll still be in trouble. Oh, I don't know what to do. <laughs> what to do? <laughs> oh, dear. 70s British sitcoms. No, it wasn't 70s, sadly, was it? It was 80s. Fuck me, yeah. Right. Then right. 70s all over it. You're, um, you're a very tactical man, Neil. So, uh, you know, as you've proved with um, tactical computer games, grand strategy, that kind of thing. So yeah. what what would be your tactic if you were in charge of these 30,000 men to find this um, beast? What would you do, archers on the hill? So no. <laughs> Yeah, arch on the hill, flank them. Yeah, find a river that you can, so they can't get flanked yourself by the beast. Okay. And no, I'd sp- spread them out in a long, thin line and just try and, like, you know, beat them out. Yeah, would you, like, an enclosing circle? Yeah. Hence a movement or something. I don't know. Okay. I, mean, I imagine this is quite a big sort of countryside where yeah. it's, it's difficult to, um, you know, 
Yeah, I know how you're going to find it. It's like needing a haystack, isn't it? But, uh, yeah. Yeah, you don't know where it's going to pop up, I suppose, either. Um, but, yeah, no, try and, try, and, um, try and draw it out, I guess. Um, By dressing up as a woman? Yeah. Well, there you go. It's always, that's what it always comes down to. Always yeah, comes yeah. down to that, all, yeah. every single war. Yeah. Dress up as a man, dressed up as a sexy lady, um, and then all of the other soldiers like do that thing with their eyes pop out like yes. in cartoons, and their tongues like go and down like a carpet. Yeah, yep. Yeah, and then they just run into the minefield normally, yes. and that's that's how you that's how you break the lines. That's, that's how it's done. That's how it's done. <laughs> Press also created popular stories out of the women and children who survived attacks by defending themselves, emphasising the virtue of the peasantry. That's quite good. It's quite forward-thinking of them. Mm. So, take Jacques a Portafat. The young boy and a group of children were out in a meadow with a herd of cattle on January the 12th, 1765, when the beast attacked. However, working together, they managed to scare it off with their bikes. With their bikes? With their pikes. Oh, pikes. Like poles with... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know why there was a lot of kids armed with bikes, but... <laughs> Still was there stealing cattle. Yeah, stealing cattle, presumably. <laughs> Slightly artful Dodger and his mates. Just to... But anyway, so he was, his courage was so admired, Louis XV paid a reward to all the children and had him educated at the King's <laughs> say, and, and had him... Had him hung. Had him... Him, <laughs> wrestling, yeah. had him bronzed. Yeah. <laughs> and put, on, put in Versailles. Yeah. To amuse the court. Like, look at this brave child. Let's have him this walking. brave boy... <laughs> had him dipped in bronze. And then there was uh, another one, this is the Marie Jean Valet, talking to statues, who was attacked on the August the 11th and managed to defend herself and wound the beast, earning herself the title Maiden of Givaudan and a statue. Ma- to Maiden of Givaudan. Yeah. Um, so she's got a statue um, in, the, in, the visage of, uh, in the village of Auvers. In what proof France. is there that she uh, wounded the beast? I don't I mean, her own... Her own word, I suppose. So it's a lie then, isn't it? Is that easy to get statues put up? Yeah, well, I mean, this is this is what they've got, so... All right. Just looking at the statue, so it's, yeah, they've got a picture of a spear. With a spear? Yeah. I don't know Why have all the kids got spears? <laughs> it seemed to be that it was like hula hoops at the time. Right. <laughs> it's the great new pointy sticks, the great new fun thing. They were like the fidget spinners of the day. Yeah. Again, they didn't have the internet, so, you know. Don't go, don't go out without your pike. You know, no, well, to be boring. fair, yeah, I mean, if you're going to, you know... Because I imagine, like, if there's wolf attacks or whatever... Yeah, be, if there's wolves and that, yeah. Then, um, yeah, and, and then there's, you know, it could be wolf attacks anyway, then, uh, yeah, you want to go out with some sort of weapon, especially if you're going carrying a load of animals or carrying or herding a load of animals around. No, you carry them, don't you? That's how you herd. You yeah. Pick each you cow. Each <laughs> pick each cow up individually and move it to the next bit of grass, yeah. yeah. Over to the cud and then back <laughs> into the, the stable, yeah. So that's why it's so so intensive. That's why cowboys are so tough. Yeah. So, you know, despite all the chili they eat, they're so stringy. Um, so the official hunters didn't have a lot of success, though. So uh, the Denevals, a father son hunter duo from Normandy, talking to Normandy, mm-hmm. announced they would travel down to eliminate the beast. I mean, you know, big big claims there. Yeah, like, who are these guys? Hey, with father and son hunting duo. Well, they checked like out. Gunslingers. John Charles, the father, boasted he'd already killed 1,200 wolves. Did he? Yeah. Well, yeah. Clay, according to him, so his own stats. Relevant information, <laughs> assuming the predator was, in fact, a wolf. But no one was sure of that. Nope. Much bigger than a wolf, wrote Lafont in an early report. It has a snout somewhat like a calves and very long hair, which would seem to indicate a hyena. No. The UML described the animal as even more fantastical. In his words, it had a breast as wide as a horse, a body as long as a leopard's, and fur that was as red as a black, was red with a black stripe. He concluded, mm. you will undoubtedly think, like I do, that this is a monster, a hybrid, the father of which is a lion. What its mother was remains to be seen. Mm. So, you know, liger. Liger. Could be. They're not red, though. No. But well, that could have just be stained with the blood of all the villagers, couldn't it, exactly, really, yeah. if you kill him one every three days? So other witnesses claim the beast had supernatural abilities. There it we could go. walk on its hind feet, 
and its hide could repel bullets, and it had fire in its eyes, <laughs> and it came back from the dead more than once and had an amazing le- leaping ability, Smith says. And, and. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Magic carpet. He'd been there. Yeah, the skin can turn to metal. Yeah. It can fire ice out of its eyes. <laughs> turn into stone. Yeah. It's lighter yeah. than air. It has, but it has it power. Swim amazing distances. It can create portals. Yep. Yeah. It can uh, fly from London to New York in under an hour. It's really good at budgeting. Yeah. Yeah. Solve the carbon crisis, climate crisis. Um. Yeah. All. all seems all you should have made friends with it. Supernatural might be useful. Supernatural stuff tends not to be too friendly, though, doesn't it? It's hell powered again, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's the that's the it's Cerberus. We're talking but Cerberus. Look, it's, it's an energy we've got to start using. As I keep saying, Chris. Oh, well, you do, you do. Yeah, yeah. To, to, it's falling on deaf ears, so unfortunately. Sadly, you're slightly un, unhinged. Oh, two more fracking. No, I mean it's, it's found pretty... it's 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 found an audience in the QAnon movement. But the, Probably has, I would imagine. The, the way to deal with. Uh, Carbon. Uh, the is the problem is to not, use, not that they believe that that's actually a climate crisis. I would imagine it is to use um, health, health spawn as a new power source. Yeah, I mean, this, is there anything that's too, too radical for? Is there is, anything they the can't do? Not to believe. Yeah, that's true. No, no, there isn't. Um, it's all mad, isn't it? And Trump's doing really well now. He's but now that he's been arrested, that means he's doing even better. Right? Yeah, well, yeah. I think it's I think literally it's a cult. Like, it's a cult. But it's, oh, it has been for, yeah, I know, well, but I mean, like, prop, like, it's uh, fucking hell. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like, I, sadly, I wouldn't be surprised if he won. No, he wouldn't, you know, I I don't think he will, but it wouldn't surprise me. I sort of don't think you want to be putting octogenarians up as your, I think, you know, I don't know. I don't think people in their 80s maybe should be. Settling down, I don't, I don't, so I think, I think to an extent that's fair enough. Well, I don't know, it's possible it's being, I sort of think, ages, but... well, a little bit, but you do, you have to admit that you do slow down as you get older, yeah. And I think that probably there should be something written, and maybe it could be an amendment in the constitution that you can't run for prime minister, prime minister, you can't run for yeah, pres- president. president if. During your term, you will go over the average life expectancy of someone in your country. Yeah. Because it's risky, isn't it? This Maybe. Is true. Maybe. Then I'm yeah. just suggesting it. I'm not American. None of my business. I'm not American. Yeah, yeah, no. I don't. Despite my you. wonderful Amer- range of American accents. This is true. So, yeah, so the Hunters are failing. Um, the Denavals gave up. So they were useful. They came in, he bragged about how many wolves he's killed, and then they fuck all. Really? Just that's um, it? Yeah, so that's it. He, he should have kept these out. He shouldn't have even named him. him. The king sent his own gun bearer and bodyguard. Yeah, I'm not sure why he's in the story. He just he just turns up, brags, and then fucks up again. Um, there you go. Apparently, it's important, important to something at the Smithsonian Magazine. But the, anyway, the gun sends his own um, gun bearer and bodyguard, Francois Antoine. Oh. Is he not getting bodyguarded at this point, I wonder? It's probably got more than one, son. hasn't he? Now I'm going to I'm going to guess. I'm going to guess you're, you're right. Along with his son, a detachment of men, he traipsed around the forested countryside in, in search of the beast. At last, in September 1765, he shot and killed a large wolf. Mm. Body sent to the cult, court at Versailles, received a reward from Louis the Fifteenth, and accepted the villagers' gratitude. Okay, so he thinks he's killed it now. But two brief months later, the attacks recommenced. Oh dear. So for another 18 months, something else was continuing to stalk the villages of Givadan with a reported 30 to 35 fatalities in that period. The king, believing the beast had already been slain, offered little aid. Yeah, whatever. No, it's, it's already been... convenient now, isn't it? It's, it's, yeah, it's already been done. Oh, Taking everyone's mind off the seven years' war. I tied well, this but... one up with a nice bow two months no, ago. Sent, what do you mean? Sent the line out. We, we got them. No, that's... It was all done. So with no assistance coming from outside the region, the locals took matters into their own hands, which is probably what they should have done at the beginning. <laughs> yeah. So because the previous hunters were unfamiliar with the landscape, they had trouble communicating with the locals as well. Yeah, yeah I can imagine that's the north-south divide thing. Yeah. Uh, these bizons from... Well, they probably had, like, regional dialects and stuff as well back then, didn't they, more so? Yeah, and I think it's probably... 
say it was a local farmer, Jean Chastel, who'd been involved in a previous hunt, but he was thrown in prison by Antoine for leading his men into a bog. That's a bit harsh. But what? Leading his men into a bog? Yeah. So they got, like, trapped in a bog? I don't know. I mean, they were drowned or something, but uh, no. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, his past crimes turned into bygones when he managed at last to bring the creature down with a bullet on June. I don't know if that's referring back to the... Um, when he did it before. Um, but anyway, what was the beast? So the end of the savagery did little to... Oh, OK, so this is, sounds like the local farmer. Yeah, he came... He, he, he killed a redemption he killed story. as well, yeah. You know, local lab makes good. Yeah. I'd love to see it. You do, he's one of our own. So that seems to have been the sort of end of the, the attacks, but it did little to answer the burning well, what question. what was it that he brought down? Well, this is the thing, he's saying... It, it, this is, they, they say this, his past crimes tend to buy games when he managed at last to bring the creature down with a bullet. Yeah. Um, what, what was it? Was there another wolf? Then what was the beast? Well, I don't know. Have a look at the corpse. If he's, if he's shot nah, if, I lost it in the bog. Sorry, yeah. but I did take it out. I'm not, not rigging at navigating. <laughs> was there. So anyway, it's been, but no, anyway, no, nobody actually knows. It's been updated ever since. Historians and scientists have suggested it was an escape lion, mm. a prehistoric holdover, or nope. even that Chastel himself trained an animal to attack people and deflect attention from other crimes. Who was Chastel again? He's the guy who shot shot them. Um, He's shot the farmer, the, end, the local farmer who, who shot it. Yeah. Uh, but, the bodies and, and, well, the fact that it had been going on for yeah, I think it's like, highly unlikely two that years one, beforehand. Do you know what I mean? That's just someone who's being overly cynical, isn't it? Yeah, yeah I, I reckon you made it all up. False flag. Yeah, false, false flag. False yeah. flag. Police yeah. attack. That, yeah, that was. A, I don't uh, think there are any victims. Al- so Al- look at this lady's gnawed upon skull. No, she's still alive. That was Al- the, Alex, the Alex Jones of the day. Yeah. <laughs> Alex Jones of 18th century France. There's a terrifying prospect. Oh, we should write a book about that. Oh, that'd be, it'd be Count Richelieu, wouldn't it? Could be. Mm. Yeah. Um... Count Rushlow, Alex Jones of his day. That's like something you'd read, isn't it? <laughs> Sound, <laughs> sounds all right. Give, for, like give, giving to, giving, been less giving things from its equivalent to. But I don't know, possibly not. You don't know, do you? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm not... I'm not. So when I when I was saying that, I didn't mean that they looked exactly the same. No, I, meant, I meant sort of propaganda, false flaggy stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know. Did Count Richelieu exist outside of Dog Tanyon? I don't know. <laughs> I was a real, yeah, he's a real person. I don't, know, I don't know much. I don't really know too much about him. I, I just know him from there. the Three Musketeers slash three Hounds. Musketeers. I'm pretty sure it was a real person. I'm embarrassed myself now when I find out he was a Dumas. It, it, it was a cartoon, cartoon fox. It was Cardinal Richelieu. He's the inventor of the table knife, apparently. Inventor of the table knife? No, this must have been an earlier one. We're just using spades before that. Well, no, I mean table knife as in a rounded. You would have, you could have used a, a knife like a butter knife. Cutting. Yeah, exactly. Um, no, I think this is an earlier Cardinal Richelieu. I mean, does that did, uh, did the butter knife need inventing? Anyway. Don't matter. Oh, I think he may just be a fiction. The one that, that, that we're all familiar I with. I think it's just a fiction, fictional character. Yeah. So look. Oh, no, hang on a second. Armand Jean de Plessis, better known as Cardinal Richelieu. Oh, no, he's, he's a French clergyman, noble statesman. Oh, whatever. Who cares? I can't, I can't actually remember which period the Three Musketeers is set in. I didn't think it was 16th century, but I could be, could be wrong. Um... Probably would be around that time, I guess. Anyway, whatever. Back to the story. So the best and most likely expectation is Givadan had a serious wolf infestation, Smith says. In other words, mm. there may not have been one single beast, but many large wolves attacking the isolated communities. Yeah, well, they would have learned off each other as well. That it was easy pickings, yeah. wouldn't they? Yeah, no, exactly, because they were hunting sort of the ones that, you know, and that, that probably explains as well why some were sort of successful and some were sort of fought off by kids and things. So, um, yeah, it's, you know, and they're going for... They're obviously going for solitary kind of like. But I mean, that's um, prey. I mean, that's a lot, isn't it? Like three hundred people in three years. I sort of can't go over that it, number. It, it is really interesting. But here's here's another one that's 
And just why just... were they gnawing the heads off and not eating the delicious uh, mussels, which is the good meat? Which is what you're going to want to go for, yeah. Unless I don't was... know, maybe they got scared off midway through or whatever when they were trying to maybe try to kill them. And... Mm. I mean, I don't know, Chris, I'm speculating here. Nobody really knows. And this is, this is why it's quite a compelling story. Yeah. Um, so wolf attacks occurred throughout France throughout this period. Morisot estimates that wolf attacks caused as many as 9,000 fatalities across the country between the end of the 16th century and the beginning of the 19th. So that would be 300 years, about 30, uh, about 30 a year. Yeah, so even then, it's, it's, this is a disproportionate amount of deaths. Yeah. So you're getting and, a lot of people dying from wolf attacks. but Well, that's why we hunted them to extinction in the UK. Because yeah. we didn't want them no, none of that attacking doesn't. people anymore. But yeah, what made the attacks in Giverdan memorable, even to today, were their violence and higher than average fatalities, as well as their precious ability to turn them into a riveting national story. Even 250 years since the Beast of Giverdan last stalked the forests and fields of southern France, its fairy tale like legacy looms large. It does. So that is, that's from the Smithsonian. That's, yeah, I think that's quite... I, I actually had heard of this one. Rarely for me, this is one I'd heard of before, although maybe not in... Is that from in, your time in France? No. Um, is that from I, your time in the um, Foreign Legion? Yes. Yeah. We don't talk about my time in the Foreign Legion, Chris. You and Phil Silvers. The Legionnaire never mentions his, his times. Um, no, it Follow was, that uh, camel. No, there was a film called uh, Christoph Gann's uh, The Pat de Loops, like The Brotherhood of the Wolf. Okay, yeah. Um, it became quite big. It, it's a French movie, I think, but it, and it's all based on this. But hilariously, he's he's got like... Um, Are they werewolves instead? No, it's... Um, well, there's a load of kind of like rural-type villagers, and then there's... Mm. Um, yeah, I think it ends up being Vincent Cassel actually had trained like um, some wolf-beast hybrid to do its bidding or some, some nonsense. Yeah. Um, but it's also, he brings with him an Iroquois um, okay. who can do martial arts. Nice. And he's just like kicking people's asses with a quarter staff and stuff. It's actually a pretty wicked movie. It's I'd thoroughly recommend it. It's very stylized. Kicking, kicking the shit out of some ignorant villagers. Well, this is exactly what happens at the start. Like they're chasing down like this um some woman and they're gonna give her a beating because they think she's a witch or something. And yeah. it's all raining and then muddy in a field, and then he sort of like just gets out and then he's you know, he's like, Oh, what are you gonna do? And he gets it and then just kicks the shit out of them. It's pretty nice. This quarter stuff. It's it's a it's a fun time. So Brotherhood of Wolf, <laughs> if you want to Fancy watching that. It, it has its own speculation about it. But yeah, you've got, um, I can't remember who the other actors are. But yeah, is it subtitled? It is subtitled, yeah. So what about for someone like me who can't I'm sure read? You can get a UK, I'm sure you can get an English dub. If you, okay, uh, yeah, if you can't read. yeah. I wouldn't recommend that I would go with the, uh, I would go with the, the subtitle version if, if, if you were talking about but, um, but I can't, so. Yeah, but it's, but anyway, yeah, so that, that's how I've heard of this before. Um, okay. Obviously, it's probably not as big outside France, but I think that would have no. probably the rise of the myth for yeah people who like alts action movies that have got a bit of a bit of something going on. This is a little bit of flavour, um, but yeah, I, there wasn't unfortunately any uh, martial art high kicking Iroquois in in the in the real story. But uh, no, um, which you know takes some points shame, off for that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think it's quite a you know it's a nice little story, and it's yeah. what's interesting about this one. I mean, it's, it's one that sort of resonated. Yeah. The fact that you know you had this spate over three years, it was you know there were really horrific injuries and things. And as you say, what when they just sort of like eating the arms and legs, or whatever, where you think you or, you know where you think you get the, the meat from? So the weird violence, very high fatality numbers. Well, there's a lot um, of people in that village as well. Yeah, if you can lose three hundred. Yeah, no, there must have been one, but it was around the whole, it was, I think it was in that whole region, wasn't it? I mean, it's totally oh, okay. was like, you know, um, un, unrelated uh, wolf attacks, whatever, but why so, why so many over such a short period? And, and why did they then stop? Um, so, yeah, of course. It's sources. like in, um, it's like in India when, like, because they've got tigers, but when a tiger, like, they, you know, it's a very specific thing when it becomes a man eating tiger, when it gets a yeah, taste yeah. for human. Yeah. Then it's like right. Well, we got, yeah, yeah. we've got to hunt it down at that point. It's um, yeah. Once they realise how easy we are to eat, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and delicious, I'll have a bit more of that. Yeah. Then, then yeah. Mm-hmm. Rather than yeah, once they lose their fear of human. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, all right. Well, should we go through a scoring system? Yes. Lovely. Okay. Well, spookiness, Neil. 
Yeah, I mean, it's not like overly supernatural, spooky type thing, is it? But I mean, the, the chunking great wolf creature biting your skull off, that's that's pretty spooky. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not sort of like, you know, chivers down the spine kind of thing, but it's, um, yeah, I mean, being a tech, you're out and you're out in a sort of village, living in a village in those kind of times, I think you'd be, you know, you've got to, you've got to earn your living shepherding your sheep or whatever. Yeah. You make sure you take your bikes out. But yeah, you, I think you're pretty, pretty scared. You know, it's, it's like national news and it's kind of like, you know, a bit of true crime thriller for the, for the urban masses in Paris and all the rest mm-hmm. of it. So yeah, I, I think it's quite chilling. I'm going to give it a seven. Seven. So yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think it is, it's spooky, not like you say, not in a paranormal way, but um, you're pretty vulnerable, aren't you, like to wolf attacks, that kind of thing, especially a pack of wolves. Like one wolf, you might have a chance, but if there's more than one. And um, and it's going for the, the more vulnerable, so um, children of that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, I mean, it would like if you were – if you're living in the countryside at the time, like it would, it would have been constantly, you'd have to be constantly vigilant, wouldn't you? And do you know what humans are like? They're not. They start titting about, and then you know that's when you drop your guards and exactly. uh, get your get your head gnawed off. So, um, yeah, I think it. I think to, if you put yourself in that place, it's pretty spooky. So I'm going to give it. It was spooky, but it's scary. So yeah. I'm, I'm going to yeah. give it an eight. Um, believability, well. Yeah, I mean, it happens. It's mm. reported, and it looks like it was one or many wolves. So there's nothing here not to believe. So it's a ten. Well, that's interesting because the way I was kind of going attack on this is kind of like, is it really a beast or is it just wolves or things like that? So, but yeah, I'll take your point. I mean, the thing is, yeah, the attacks did happen. There was something out there. All, yeah, there's you know, turns around with a hyena or whatever. But yeah. I'm going to make it a nine, but yeah, I think you're right. You know, it, it's definitely these attacks did happen. There was something, and you know, not everyone's claiming it wasn't a wolf or what have you. It just has become a urban legend because of the ferocity of the attack. So, yeah, yeah. Be a nine for me. So, narrative premise, Neil. Um, yeah, well, again, they made a film out of it, although they did have to throw in some martial arts in fairness. Yeah, uh, you know, know, every film I, needs that. Yeah, that's true. It should do, it should do it as a matter of course, anyway. Biography of Churchill, yeah, getting some. Some kung fu. Um, Would like Churchill, the Hollywood years. Yes, yeah, it's quite. Deep. That's, that's a very right. small cameo from Reason Mortimer. Reason Mortimer in it, yeah, yeah. That's an all right. Uh, film. I'll give it a give it a pass. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's quite funny actually. Um, well, it's yeah, it's watchable. Um, don't know all that. Uh, no, uh, well, I've got time for Christians later as well. Yeah, most to be fair. Yeah, that was, it was fine. Um, what was what was I, what was I on? Um, narrative premise. Narrative premise. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I think there's um, yeah, I think there's quite a lot of stuff that converges on here, which is quite nice. This, this, the beginnings of the press in France is starting to lean into sort of some of the sensationalized sensationalized stuff. You know, you've got the the royal court who are starting to notice all of these things until they get bored because I think they've already sorted it out. Um, yeah, I think it's quite a rich narrative that you can praise. Well, already it's on this. I think you know. Um, yeah, I think it's quite. I'm going to give it an eight. Yeah, I think it's good as well, and um, it sounds like it was within France at least, but possibly wider, like a very, uh, like a very early sort of true crime thing. Mm. Um, so it's probably quite, quite an important story. And you know, I mean, even if you if you took that out of it, then it's still kind of villagers and something in the from the woods is killing them off and stuff so i mean it's quite and it's an early again it's an early thing of that i mean that's kind of a bit of a hollywood trope now but yeah this, you wonder but this is all being werewolves and stuff like that i don't know didn't mention it but yeah so um yeah i agree i think it's good so i'm going to give it an eight as well um so reach um so for me, this is where it falls down a bit. Uh, I've not heard of it. I don't know how big it is outside of France. You said there's a film about it, but again, yeah, it's a French, it French film. film. Although it became successful internationally, but yeah. Well, uh, you know, as successful as, as anything the with subtitles ever does. The director got to do a Silent Hill movie eventually, <laughs> which bombed terribly because it was awful. But yeah. Um, so I don't think its reach is very big. 
I don't know how much it'd be known in France, but I mean, it's an it's an old one, and you know, it's well, mm. it's it's well documented and it survives. So I'm going to give it a four for each. Now, yeah, probably fair enough. I would say. I mean, I would say I, it, it's because it's one of the rare ones I've heard of, which always makes me think the reach is probably bigger than it is. But I think you're right. I think it's probably one that's more known, well known in France. Well, this is the Smithsonian Magazine writing about it, although they're probably more interested in the kind of like you know, the historical aspects and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, I don't know how well it's known outside of, you know, people have seen the movie or what have you, uh, outside of France, but, yeah, it's a reasonable one, so I'm going to give it a five. That gives an overall score of 59, which is a oh, very wow. nice high score. <laughs> um, cool, well, yeah, that was a good one. Um, the fact that it's real and... It's, yes, um, it's always nice. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm glad, that was interesting. I'm glad I've learnt about it. Um... Cool. Um, yeah, if you if you want to get in contact, you know, usual uh, uh, legends at gmail dot com. Um, I'd say you can follow us on our Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it. But uh, I've still not really got around to doing much on that. Um, but it is legends of uh, uh, Bane. Um, well, one of these days, a, an aubergine symbol or a penis or something <laughs> with the next iteration of Musk's strategic and brand. Just, and it's just and it's just called Bad Lads. It's just called Muskies. Muskies Lord. <laughs> hey, did you send any Muskies Lords today? Um, I can pay for my Muskies Lord account. I'm a Muskies Lord, though. <laughs> hey, this Muskies Lord certainly allows me to Muskies Lord. Um, yeah, well, that's it for this week. And I hope you have a nice week, whatever you're doing, and enjoying the end of another summer in the Northern Hemisphere. And uh, we will see you again next week. Goodbye. Goodbye.